we are very honored to have uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Johnson with us. Um, next, I'll, uh, Mr. Kaun Cocker, um, who's the founder and managing partner of the uh, Cocker Advocates, which is a leading law firm based in Kabul. Uh, Mr. Cocker has worked for the UNEMA um, during the constitution making process. Uh, so we are looking forward to hearing his insights um, uh, from the formative uh, and times of the constitution. He's also acted as the advisor uh, to many uh, uh, constitutional commissions and con uh, constitutional Louis Jirga bodies uh, during the constitution making process. Um, Mr. Colin Cocker has authored many books and he uh, 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 holds a Juris Doctor, JD from the University of California and a bachelor's degree in political science from the University of California in San Diego. Uh, next, we have uh, Dr. Hossein Ramos with us, uh, who's uh, uh, currently advisor to the Afghanistan's Attorney General Office. He's also worked previously as the Executive Director of Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission and uh, Deputy Director of National Democratic Institute in Afghanistan. He has also co-founded several civil society organizations in Afghanistan, focusing on promotion of democracy and uh, public participation in politics. And uh, last but certainly not least, the author of the work, uh, uh, Jennifer Brick uh, Murtazashvili, who's a director of the Center for Governance and Markets uh, and associate professor, of, um, associate professor at the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Pittsburgh. Her research focuses on issues of self-governance, security, political economy, and public sector reform in developing countries. She's authored several books, um, uh, two books on Afghanistan in particular, uh, on themes and related to Afghanistan, one book on Afghanistan in particular, Informal Order and the State in Afghanistan, which was published by Cambridge University Press and received the best book award in social sciences by the Central Eurasian, uh, Eurasian uh, Studies Society. Um, we are honored to have you all here. Thank you very much. Um, I will start by asking uh, uh, Professor Murtazashvili to just Summarize the main thesis and arguments of the work uh, to get us started, please. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Haroon, uh, for the very generous introduction. And I just want to thank all of our colleagues for being here today. Um, it's hugely humbling to have this opportunity to speak in, in front of um, such esteemed colleagues from whom I have learned so much over the years. And uh, as a student of Afghanistan, um, I'm also very you know, sensitive to the dynamics inside of Kabul right now. And when this paper was written almost a year ago, um, the situation in the country was, was very different. So I wanna thank um, colleagues at AISS uh, for putting this paper series together on uh, democracy in Afghanistan and Dr. Muradian and Dr. Omar Sadr who were very key in, in pulling this project together. Um, you know, last week, the United States announced that it would pull its military forces out of Afghanistan by September of this year. And in so much of the discussion that we hear in the United States, so much of the discussion has focused around the project of democracy being a failure in Afghanistan. And to me, this is heartbreaking because I don't think the project has been a failure at all. In fact, I think a lot of this discussion is quite unfair to the people of Afghanistan who have struggled so much and sacrificed so much to build a better state. And so much of this discussion characterized Afghanistan as unprepared for democracy or somehow incapable of managing this, these responsibilities. I also think this is unfair to people who have given so much to build a better future. I do think, however, that decisions made by the international community and some in the Afghan government really limited the possibilities of democracy to flourish. So on the one hand, we see this flourishing civil society that looks that takes many different shapes in urban and rural areas and a democracy that really struggles. So one of the things I was trying to do in this paper was trying to figure out this paradox of why you can have such an active civil society. And what does civil society look like in urban areas, especially in Kabul, it takes the form of NGOs and so many advocacy organizations that I think many of us are familiar with. In rural areas, civil society 
has a very different feel. And that's what I spent most of my research and my career looking at is rural life and looking at the ways individuals and communities solve problems at the local level. And I think the, the capabilities of so many people in so many communities has really been underestimated by so many that this, this also informal sort of civil society has also not been given enough credit for helping people and maintaining sustenance during such difficult times, not just over the past 20 years, but over the past 40 years. So very briefly, my argument is very simple. Democracy in Afghanistan has not lived up to potential because it was never really given a chance to thrive. And the blame for this cannot be found in its citizens or its civil society or in its vibrant media. It's been limited for two main reasons. First, the 2004 constitution never allowed Afghanistan's democracy to live up to its promise as the institutional arrangements that governed post 2001 failed to create incentives for participation in the state system. The constitutional provisions that could have allowed for greater participation through elections in their districts and cities were ignored. Second, Staggering corruption in presidential and parliamentary elections disillusioned many from the democratic project. And so the consequence of this is a dynamic political class that is concentrated heavily in Kabul and groups in Kabul tend to have vested interest in preserving, to democ in preserving democracy. Why? <clears throat> because they have participated in it. They have benefited from it. They have understood how it works from the bottom up in districts and communities around the country where most government, appoint, uh, government officials still remain appointed from the center, individuals in rural areas after 2001 had great hopes for changes in how the state would affect them, how they would interact with the state in a different way. There was enormous hopes, enormous aspirations. But if you live in a village, if you live in a district and even provinces, provincial capitals to a similar extent, you are still faced with government officials who are appointed by the center. And this means that individuals had really no way to aggregate preferences, different points of view into meaningful policies, into meaningful changes in their lives. How could people organize for something better? Uh, how could people see that the effects of democracy in their lives at the local level where things matter the most to them? Of course, they could participate in elections for parliament and for a very distant executive. But as we know, these elections were heavily tainted by corruption. And the more each, each subsequent election was met by increased levels of corruption and decreased levels of participation. And I believe that if those outside of Kabul would have had more opportunities for participation in their own system and, and accountability and holding officials accountable for decisions that they'd make and given genuine opportunities to participate in the process. I think we would have ended this period with a more legitimate state, a state that was more legitimate in the eyes of its people and much more support for democratic institutions that many in Kabul have rallied around. I think also broader participation could have staved off much of this insurgency because you would be giving people the opportunity to have a voice in what's happening in their own communities. And of course, it's not fair to blame the Afghan government for the rise of this insurgency, but certainly it would have uh, greater um, opportunities for participation would have um, perhaps not created the kind of fertile ground for recruitment. Um, so I think this is a very simple uh, overview of a, of a complicated paper that gets into issues of urban rural divides that I think have been exasper uh, exacerbated by this uh, period. And I look forward to your comments. Thank you. Thank you very much for that great summary. Let me now go to Mr. Cocker. Um, as a person who was personally involved and closely observed the process of creation of the 2004 constitution, which relatively was a very open process compared to uh, its, uh, 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 its precedents. Uh, why did uh, different stakeholders agree uh, on the current design 
uh, which consists of a strong presidential uh, system and a tendency towards centralization, although there are uh, decentralizing like features, but there was a tendency towards centralization and a strong presidential uh, force. Um, Thank you very much for this opportunity. And I must also just in that introduction, you you were a little too generous for me that I've authored many books. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't yet authored books. I've authored some articles, but not books yet. So just wanted to correct that. Um, and uh, I think it's important to look at the context at that time. What was Afghanistan like? And and what were the priorities and the issues of the Afghans at that time? So I think uh, in what they had gone through and, and why the system was chosen. As you pointed out as well, I think the 2004 constitution, the process was the most, uh, compared to all other previous constitutional pro processes in Afghanistan, it was the most transparent and the, the most that the public were engaged in and actually the most that the Afghan and international experts were involved in. So there was expertise made available from many countries and from from Afghanistan. And it was a relatively long process. It was more than a year uh, of a process. It started with late 2002 and then the constitution was adopted in January 2004. And it included a in a period for a public consultation. This in a situation which was actually quite challenging. Uh, at that time, security was an issue, but the more uh, important or bigger challenge was actually the logistics because the roads were not uh, built, uh, communication lines were not clear, getting people organized. And I think one of the security challenges was more actually you having armed groups in different places uh, that is, you had a lot of um, like you know, strong men and armed groups, militias, I would call them, you know, around the country. So in that time, during this process, uh, the key issues that actually came out during the discussions in the process were more about the form of government. Um, there were debates about presidential or semi-presidential with a prime minister and so forth. Some uh, had argued for a kind of a parliamentary system, but overwhelmingly the support was for the presidential system. And I think the, and the other issues that actually uh, became, um, led to heated debates were kind of identity issues, language, role of language, which language, so forth. And some discussions about the Supreme Court versus constitutional court and so forth. Frankly, uh, the administration, the, which is the central and the core issue for discussion today, was not of, uh, of a high priority at that time, or the change of it was not a high priority. I mean, you can look at all the language, all the you know, literature that came out from that time. There were some, the only, um, there were some proposals at the constitutional law jerga uh, with regard to some extension, but I think the overall, the, the way the, the draft was you know, structured, which was <coughs> centralized, but at the same time, the, allowed the law to be passed later that would actually uh, you know, delegate authority to the various um, local uh, bodies. That was more or less, uh, <clears throat> was, uh, people were comfortable with it. I think we have to be a little careful that this was a, again, this was a, a constitution that at the end, 502 delegates to the constitutional law jerga, except to one or two, everybody else accepted it, adopted it. The process was very democratic as I said, compared to many other constitutional processes. Somehow suggesting that it was somehow the, done by internationals or a few Afghans, is probably just not fair. Uh, and, and it's sometimes actually been even uh, mentioned by the armed opposition that somehow all these constitutions and others are, you know, they're being imposed by foreigners and others. They're not, these are the, and, and, and if you ask me, why was this, this administration was an issue? One of the key issues during that time, 2003 and 2004, must not forget is Afghanistan was a countryside, or in fact, throughout the country was armed. People, their biggest complaint at that time were 
about how local strongmen and their militias actually abused them. They, we, we had not gone through even a unsuccessful disarmament pro, uh, uh, in the process at that time. Uh, this, this, the political space in the provinces and beyond for any democratic engagement and so forth were very limited. They were, the services delivery was very limited and they actually, the, the institutions were, you know, had been destroyed. So people were actually looking for Kabul to impose rules, has an established rule of law and to deliver services to be able to them. There was very strong support, for example, there was strong call for the national army, national police, because people thought that these institutions were what could curtail the powers of the local power holders. Most of them were armed and so forth. So at that time, I think it's very logical for people to uh, have chosen, favored a central, a Kabul that was seen as more benign, that was seen as more kind of uh, fair, that could help them get through this. Now, after 20 years, of course, and the constitution gave uh, leeway for the changes to be accommodated through the law. Nothing. So that was the reason, but perhaps we'll get into the more yeah, thank, you, discussion. thank you so much for that context. And let me now go to Professor Johnson. Uh, the choice, as uh, Mr. Cocker described, was made at the time. What were the effects of those choices uh, made in the 2004 on the democratization and the state building uh, that unfolded since then in Afghanistan? Yeah, I'll answer that question, but I want to first talk about bond. I think many of the problems that Afghanistan has, has faced is because what came out of bond. Um, the dilemma of the bond accords was that they attempted nation building and state building during a time of conflict and national emergency, which, you know, which was difficult. And, and bond resulted in a strategy to build and establish in two and a half years, based on the bond political map, a government and associated processes, such as the constitution, uh, official relationships that had taken three decades to totally destroy. Uh, moreover, Bond refused to recognize that strong central presidential type governments, I believe, uh, were historically ineffective in Afghanistan, where weak go central governments and traditional systems of local and village uh, governance had flourished and did not allow for the participation of political parties and importantly did not allow for moderate Taliban to participate um, at the uh, uh, original Bond conference. You've got to realize that the United States, were, while there were a number of different party groups that we all know about, the United States run, ran bond. And I think one of the underlying dynamics that you have to understand is we, we I mean, Karzai was our guy there, and we were not going to allow any types of systems that were going to challenge Karzai because we thought he was in our back pocket. Now that might be an understatement. So take, a, take for example, the Loya Jirga. It's not democratic at all. I mean, in the last Loya Jirga election in 2018, looking at Kabul, Afghanistan's largest um, uh, province, uh, 23 of the 33 delegates elected got less than 1% of the vote. The leading, uh, Romani, the leading vote getter got 2% of the vote. And it's like that throughout the entire country. So we allowed for a single non-transferable vote to create a legislature that really didn't have any constituencies. It, it, you know, it's like California, we have 52 congressional delegations. Can you imagine if every Californian, oh, you know, near 40 million of them, 42 million, had to vote for one candidate? rather than having a district that you elected the candidate from. So, I mean, the, the problem is, is democratic institutions were never, uh, I believe, de developed in, in, in a way where they could succeed. Um, uh, and, 
And, uh, and also, I think that one of the major problems, and I've seen this really grow, unfortunately, over the last three or four years. I mean, you know, I've, 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 I've published on every election since 2004. Oh, and let me say another thing. Remember, Bond initially said that in spring of 2004, they were going to have um, presidential, uh, legislative, provincial, and district elections all at the same time. The United Nations came back and said those would be the most difficult elections that had ever been held. So what happened is, as you know, we had the presidential election in 2004. We put off the legislative elections till 2005, and we've never had the provincial and district elections. Okay, so for a long time, I mean, you know, to become a, you know, Karzai actually, I've been told this, and I, I believe it's true. At one time, in like around 2005, 2006, Karzai was micromanaging to such an extent that he had a basically okay a school teacher in Badakhshan. Uh, and it, 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 it just it wasn't there. So my position is that we never really, you know, elections do not equal democracy. And the elections in Afghanistan have been some of the most fraudulent, and I can give you all kinds of data on it, than, than I've ever seen. And plus, people voted in blocks. The probability uh, for Pashtun voting for a Pashtun, and it's interesting because the four leading candidates in, you know, in, in 2004 were you know, Karzai, Pashtun, uh, Mahak, uh, uh, um, Hazara, uh, um, Dostum, Uzbek, and Kanani uh, Tajik. And the probabilities of an ethnic group voting for their ethnic candidate had probabilities around 85 to 90%. So one of the problems that has long um, been a problem in Afghanistan has been ethno ethnolinguistic fragmentation that Barney Rubin wrote so well about 20 years ago. And I mean, the elections, and I, I remember uh, writing about the first election, just sort of reified those ethno-linguistic fragmentations. They did not unite the country. There's never been a truly international president. Karzai, you know, I mean, he blatantly stole the 2014 election. Let me just read one thing about that to show you the extent that he stole it. Let me uh, hold on just a second, um, because it, it, it's quite telling. Um, and this is this is 2014. Uh, I had I had all the polling data, and in in, in 2014, a uh, ballot box could have 600 votes in it. So um, my analysis, which nobody has ever challenged, uh, I found that 606 polling places called on ballot boxes. Ghani received all 600 votes. Abdullah Abdullah is zero. That's statistically impossible. That could never happen. And in another 900 polling centers, uh, uh, Ghani got all the votes but five. And I truthfully believe that what, you know, Ghani, I think he got, I mean, I'm Prasad and I'm Grad in Afghanistan because when I published this, Ghani wasn't very pleased. Uh, but in 2014, he was much more settled in how he stole the election. He closed certain, he closed certain polling places uh, that were basically in Abdullah's uh, uh, areas. And, you know, and he claimed that they were because of violence, but he left all of Eastern and Southern Afghanistan. He didn't close one polling place. So I don't think, them, you know, true democracy has ever been uh, uh, present in Afghanistan. And, you know, a lot of people say elections, but the elections, even if they were perfect, do not represent democracy. And in the case of Afghanistan, they've been some of the most corrupt elections that I've ever seen. And, you know, so I, I think that the problems that we're facing right now go all the way back to Bond. I mean, trying to create for a very conservative country, uh, a, a very modern country, a, a political system that relates to very modern countries in two and a half years, three years, three and a half years is absolutely delusional. Um, you know, I, I like to tell my students and I'm not gonna get into, because this will be controversy, but our constitution in the United States, which is a great constitution, 
was published and ratified in 1887. When did women get the vote, the, the opportunity to vote in the United States? 1919, almost 140 years later. So we tried to do things over a short period of time in a very conservative culture where cultural dynamics are more important in my mind than political dynamics, especially relative to ethno-linguistic differentiations. We tried to do things that just weren't possible to succeed. We, we set ourselves up for failure. And, and I think that's the major problem. Thank you so much. Uh, let me now go. I mean, a, a, a great take. Uh, there were some minor issues. There were a number of provincial elections. Uh, uh, there were no district elections. And uh, yeah. I think you can say, what is your gap? But you said, your gap. Just the underlying points is still valid. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Ramuz, uh, if you may, we've been talking about the institutional design, like how the constitution was set up and the choices were, that were made at the time. But how important was the constitution itself compared to other factors in democratization and in state building in Afghanistan? Mr. Cocker highlighted the security issues. Uh, uh, Professor Johnson highlighted the, the cultural and, 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 and uh, linguistic issues, ethnicity. Generally, how important was the constitution? How much did the constitution matter and the choices made matter uh, in your opinion? I think you need to unmute yourself. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks from AISS and Mr. Rahimi for facilitating this great uh, uh, conversation now. And I should also congratulate uh, Dr. Jennifer for her, her great achievement in, in that very nice and meaningful article on democratization in Afghanistan. Uh, fortunately, I remember those days because I, I was uh, very actively engaged in, in those days, including holding the uh, uh, creation of many institutions in those days, including the um, establishment for the constitution. I should also attract your attention to the fact that culturally, politically and culturally, there were some of the settings in those days that uh, were putting shadows on many decisions that international community and civil society and, and state men were, were taking. Um, one of those contexts was that Afghanistan was coming out of a very long and uh, authoritarian regime, an ideologic regime, which uh, during those decades of those kind of authoritarian regime, there were certain um, things that were totally absent and the people of Afghanistan, number one, priorities were demanding. One was a rule of law and 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 the, it was applying to the people because there was very broad consultation going on and I was part of that. United, uh, UNAMA, our United Nations political mission in Kabul, was uh, hosting several meetings every day with the representative of people, with civil society, with the key uh, uh, partisans, with political parties, and they were listening to the people. And the same diplomatic mission in Kabul city it was we're also holding so many meetings, meeting people. And this was one of the priority of the people of Afghanistan because we were coming out of the civil war in the absence of a constitution or implementation of rule of law. And pr prior to that, there was a Taliban regime. And prior to that, we had, we had a communist regime, which was uh, very ideologically kind of authoritarian. So th the first one was, uh, the first demand from both the people and the political missions in Kabul was, the first thing is how to place the rule of the game, and that was uh, the constitution. So this was giving legal, legal framework for opening a new era for Afghanistan. But unfortunately, again, under the same contextual misunderstanding of the time, there was no belief in the efficiency of political party in Afghanistan. And I was uh, working with National Democratic Institute and, and we went and talked with the electoral commission of those days about the role of political party and unanimously, I should say that the members of the electoral commission were so against the political party and they were telling us the political party just remind us of those brutal monop uh, monopolizing political parties of the autocratic or 
communist regime in, in Afghanistan. And I should say that to some extent, this was also the belief of the interim administration uh, of those days. The second was that because of very overwhelmingly impression of the warlordism domination, dominance in those days of Afghanistan, unfortunately, this, I should say exaggeratively, estimation of the power of the warlords in some regional or rural areas of Afghanistan sacrificed the notion of giving the provincial and regional, regional citizens of Afghanistan a voice to participate. There was an assumption those days that if we do not have a strong central government, we would not be able to control the warlords or those militias that even they were not demilitarized those days. So the mistake started from this kind of false notion under a very wrong contextual impression of, of those days that unfortunately we went through a process to support the idea of establishing a very strong central presidential system in Afghanistan and um, not uh, uh, taking into consideration the seriousness of that it, once you have a constitution in place in a very unstable context in Afghanistan, it would not be easy to address and, and, and amend it. Thank you very much. Uh let me go back to uh, Professor Murtazashvili, and um, it seems like we are dealing with um, a reality of the ground at the time when the 2004 constitution was, uh, was being made and uh, uh, kind of a, a more uh, long-term view, a forward-looking view of what was going to become of the 2004 constitution. And possibly there, was, uh, there were hard choices to be made and some choices were made to create the current system. I just want to pose this to you. I mean, it's a bit counterfactual, so, but still. Uh, while formerly Afghanistan laws favor concentration of power, uh, political power, and um, in the capital, for a long time, the central government was weak relative to provincial and regional power holders. What would have been the impact of formalizing the de facto power, uh, power of the regional power holder on democratization of the country uh, in the 2004 constitution early on? Uh, um, so this is a really good question, and uh, counterfactuals are always fun because you can always be right about them. Um, <laughs> but I would just, you know, urge some caution here because um, I think Dr. This goes back to the point that Dr. Ramuz just made about what was happening. This counterfactual argument that we're seeing this discussion between a strong central government. And if there is no strong central government, we're going to have warlords and warlord governance. And there was never room, and there still, I think, has not been room for anything in between these two dichotomies, right? So the assumption is, you know, I think underlying your question, um, Dr. Rahimi, if I'm not mistaken, that you know, this de facto arrangement would have favored warlords and that there's warlord governance or central governance. And I think that by trying to prevent warlord governance or strongman governance or however we want to call it and, and the political parties that they embodied that the central government actually made them stronger and this is the counterfactual i'd like to present to you is that it gave individuals by trying to weaken the role of political parties and that was like the 2004 law 2005 law on political parties sort of a good example of that um, you know in the first parliamentary elections you couldn't affiliate as a member of political party so but political parties are a really important part of civil society. And of course, you know, people's attitudes towards political parties were shaped by these ideological images of the past, not, and not just from, from the 80s, but also you know, the warlord parties of the 90s and so forth. Um, but by keeping, these, by keeping political parties out of politics, you didn't actually give society a chance to regroup politically. You didn't give a chance to society to form political parties that had to do with other political issues, policy issues, um, issues that didn't have to do with, with ethnic identity. And other countries have actually confronted this and have you know, engineered constitutions to help, to help deal with this issue. Uh, I'm not suggesting that that could have been the course here, but I think that by trying to prevent the strong men, the rules that were put in place actually made them stronger. It didn't weaken them because it gave individuals and groups no other mechanism to cha channel 
politics into the formal system. It created a huge gap between a de jure and a de facto. And that gap widened over time. It didn't it didn't narrow. And so, you know, so often, um, you know, among friends in Kabul, I hear, and it goes back to periods of Afghan history, of course, that, you know, you, you build a strong central government, and then we can think about decentralizing. And there's sort of the sequential notion of consolidating the state. And then, you know, when people are ready and prepared, then you can give them some power. And to me, that was, I think, uh, to be honest, a bit painful. Um, because I started doing work in villages around 2005 and already at that point people had very strong expectations and I you know disagree with you Professor Johnson I would say that um, norms in communities were actually quite prepared for democracy people um, were very acutely aware of what their rights are right and this to me is very important people understood when their rights were being violated maybe they didn't understand every um, aspect of the constitution, but this is sort of indignant to human dignity. I mean, even in an America with a very developed democracy, right? People don't know what the constitution says, but they know when they feel when their rights are being violated. So the onus is not on people to know all of their rights. The onus is on the government to protect the rights of citizens. And people knew when they could feel, right? With these indignities and the alienation, that if you look at all the public opinion surveys, you know, confidence in the state ha has dropped significantly. Confidence in democracy has dropped significantly. I did statistical analysis, um, you know, for a book I wrote, uh, for the book that uh, uh, Dr. Rahimi mentioned. And, you know, I found that when communities actually have stronger customary uh, governing systems, they have more support for democracy and more support for women's rights because these organizations actually, people feel that they protect their interests more than the state. And when they're dealing with the state, they're, it pro provides sort of a bulwark that allows them to interact with the state with more confidence than when they don't have them. Um, so, you know, to answer your question about laws, I mean, if we look about, uh, I'm actually working on a book with a, with a colleague, um, uh, Dr. Mohammad Karam Shah right now, and we're looking at public administration, the history of public administration in Afghanistan, and I'm looking at how the administrative regulations that built the state in the post-2001 period largely came from the past, not even from the post-2001 period, but from the country's communist history, even Taliban era, era regulations from the, from the 1970s and, and in areas of public financial management, um, budgeting, and you know, Dr. Uh, uh, Johnson, you spoke about you know, democracy is about much more than elections. And I think what we say is that democracy is about what happens between elections. And between elections, that's governance. And governance is how the power of the executive and how the power of the state is executed. And so when those things didn't change fundamentally for people, the expectations that this was somehow a new and different system because they could vote for a president, but yet they couldn't be represented through political parties, as was the case in the past, um, it didn't create new venues to aggregate opinions, to act to create new opportunities for policies. So it ended up reifying the past problems rather than giving opportunities for change. Thank you so much. Jen, I agree with most of what you say. Uh, Mr. Cockhart, I mean, you made the point that the constitution actually um, was pretty much under specified when it came to administration. There was a lot of leeway given to future legislation to form the actual uh, shape of the, uh, the uh, public administration in Afghanistan. And Professor Murtaz actually pointed out that that opportunity was not actually taken on. And it, we kind of saw a continuation of the past alternative and a strongly cent ideologically centralized systems to just um, continue endure. Uh, why did you think, what were the reasons behind the failure to operationalize uh, the decentralizing features or potentials of the 2004 constitution? Very good question again. Uh, I think uh, Professor Johnson said one thing that I'd like to perhaps repeat here, and that is, he said, in the U.S. Constitution, you know, which was, I've studied it and it's considered one of the best constitutions in the world, women had the right to vote over 100 years later after its adoption. I think the idea is that constitutions are not a panacea for all ills and right away, and it takes time. And that's why 
And here too, the constitution is also, uh, in fact, in many post-conflict countries, there's even an idea that they should even include a clause that says the constitution should be reviewed after seven, 10, 12 years, because they are made under a lot of duress. They are made under a lot of difficulties. So Johnson, again, I agree with you that the time that was given was very short. And therefore, maybe a lot of issues were not fully resolved. But at the same time, Afghanistan or the situation was such that it didn't have the, the benefit, the luxury of much longer. So, and therefore, a constitutional order takes time to mature. And expecting everything to be resolved all at once is a misconception and probably erroneous. In this case, yes, there were features for decentralization or delegation of authority to the provinces and so forth. Why? I mean, one of the things that we here we're discussing is, I don't think we're discussing enough as to why, why things didn't happen well, why democratization actually didn't make much progress and didn't get, and in fact, many people would be now even reviewing it, assessing and researching this question. One of the issues is, it's just very difficult. It is very difficult. The superpower after 20 years is now coming to realization that it cannot transfer a country despite all its resources and so forth. And that for Afghanistan too. Quickly, I'll tell you, security deteriorated. That had, and these were issues not about kind of the structure of the, let's say the, uh, the system, but foreign powers intervened, neighboring countries did some harmful things that would have made, put a lot of pressure on any system. In fact, uh, one thing that I would like to point out that in many African post-colonial countries, they adopted federal systems. Many of them failed. Mm -hmm. So it's not, so federal system by itself is not a, like it would be, it would apply and be successful, you know, in all regions. There are just the context matters, the regional, the international context matters. So yes, why it didn't happen? I think, and I think since things haven't worked out well, there are a lot of blame to be spread around. I think people should take blame, including international community, including those in the government, they could have done things, should have done things differently, better. I think, yes, uh, under the constitution, maybe one of the first laws that should have been passed should have been the local administration law. To this day, that has not been passed. Well, it should have been passed. The big issue with not holding these elections was technical reasons. The issue of, I mean, disarmament didn't go very well. You have to create political space for democratization, peaceful political space. It just cannot just happen overnight. And in some village, people are doing well and resolving their issues. And therefore, the whole country can actually work out this type of system. It doesn't work that way. The, I mean, the demarcation, especially when it came to districts, because a lot of populations had moved in different places. There were disputes, in fact, even between districts. You know, for many years, the number of districts is actually even unclear. You ask different authorities. It was not clear. So the demarcation, because when you do district elections, whoever lives in this home should know where the person is going to be voting on this district or this district. You have to make this kind of delineation. Population estimates had to be made. And so many of these things, unfortunately, the other thing, one of the things that actually I was part of the international community and I was also I uh, will say that we had a role to play and I think a responsibility for a lot of these elections and so forth, the projects and you know, um, Mr. Ramos was also a colleague in, in many of these areas. The elections and so forth were supported as projects. Okay, elections is coming, oh, it's very late, oh, let's get to it. In between, not a lot of things were being done. For example, delimitation. It was not interesting and attractive enough for people to, for foreigners to put in their money in it for other matters. So I think in many of these issues, basically the democratization process in Afghanistan failed challenges. I mean, faced extreme challenges and difficulties. Thank you.
And we must ask then again, even some larger question as to in which societies democratization thrives and in which society it failed. There's some very basic pillars of democracy that unfortunately Afghanistan has not developed enough. Let us focus on those real reasons because then we can address them and we can actually make progress. Afghanistan is extremely poor. The development level is very low. That is one of the attempts. So you can look at all the literature says whatever the development level is low, democracy tends to fail or cannot sustain. The rule of law, very weak to this day in many areas. The rule of law and so forth. And then the capacity in many areas, again, for this kind of democratization and so forth in the international context. I think all of those areas must be looked at and take a more like an objective uh, assessment of how things in fact uh, didn't work out as they should have and how they can work out going forward. One last point if I make here, I'm sorry I'm taking a little longer, the issue of political parties. Uh, absolutely, Afghans in general, there's show me one um, public opinion survey that shows support for political parties of large numbers. It is not there. Now, we can argue whether it's because the political parties haven't done well, their history is back, but we all recognize political parties for a flourishing democracy is essential. But yet that is the case. So why hasn't the political party flourished? Yes, some of it is related to law. Some of it is related to the activities, platforms, and background in, of these political parties. We should focus on improving these things. Then we can have a more thriving, actually, you know, strong pillars of democracy. I think in that case, the system becomes issue of secondary. I think, you know, focus on those pillars of democracy are more important than the structure of the system because in many countries, the systems have actually have been secondary. They have failed in some places they have uh, not, but I think as long as Afghanistan does not build those pillars of democracy, unfortunately, the chances of thriving democracy will be difficult. Thank That's you so much. Uh, Professor Johnson, uh Dr. Uh, Murzarkali was making the point that the centralized system actually ended up empowering the warlords, strong strongmen, then actually weakening their power. So the actual fear became true, even though people were denied uh, uh, a, a formal way to participate in the government. How do you think the decentralization of political power uh, now or in the past uh, would affect the issue of the monopolization of use of force, violence? Uh, in Afghanistan, uh, because that was a concern then, as uh, Mr. Uh, Kaka talked about disarmament and how things would have been different if we had a formalized decentralized system. And it is a still issue today. I don't think it's uh, resolved per se. Well, the first thing I want to say is that for the first four years of the United States participation in Operation Enduring Freedom, you know, and Bush admits this, the regional leaders that we liked were called regional leaders. The regional leaders that the United States did not like were called warlords. And, you know, um, so I think that regional leaders are extremely important, especially, I mean, let me put it this way. I was seconded to the Canadian army um, to serve as General Vance's senior political advisor from 2009 to 2010. I spent all my time down in Kandahar and, and, and Dand and, and Panjway. And, uh, you know, um, uh, I would talk to, I would talk to Kandahari businessmen. And, and, and as that, the big problem, as you know, at that time, was you started to see the influx back of many of the uh, Afghans that had left during uh, the Soviet invasion, you know, literally 20 years before. And the biggest conflict that occurred um, between different families, between different groups, was were concerning water rights and land rights. And the judicial system that Karzai and the central government put together 
basically took about six months on the average to resolve one of these issues. And I'm being somewhat facetious here, but only somewhat. And usually the winner usually was the one who paid off the prosecuting and prosecuting and defense and the judge the most money. So you actually had a lot of Kandahari businessmen who you would never think would support the Taliban that actually went down to Zanga um, to use before we destroyed the brick and mortar, their court system, because they would make these land and water decisions uh, you know, overnight. And, and, and my position is, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but my, my reading of uh, uh, Afghan history is that you know, really the first strong central government was Rahman in the 1880s to 1890s. And of course, you know what he also did. Uh, secret police were everywhere. I mean, he bragged about the cells, the, the skulls of the Afghans that he killed. And he did create a national army, but he also created an incredible, you know, secret police force. And I think that, you know, the, the people that I dealt with, the people that I dealt with in, you know, uh, a Pange way or whatever, had much more respect for the local leaders than they did for Kabul because Kabul was viewed as so corrupt and, um, uh, and, and the corruption was way beyond cross the line to be acceptable. I truthfully um, uh, did not see, and I spent a lot of time in the villages with my translator. I did not, and I'd ask this question all the time, I did not find a lot of rural villagers um, in, in Southern Afghanistan, especially in the Kandahar province. Uh, that understood representative democracy. They had no idea because in many respects, they've been practicing pure Greek democracy for two millennia through the Jirga system. Um, and of course the Soviets desperately tried to destroy that, but I found that it still existed in many, many villages. And uh, I just think, you know, that when we, when we first went into Afghanistan, 80% of the Afghan people lived in rural districts. Now it's about 75%. And a good percentage of those people really dislike Kabul for a whole variety of reasons. And they were not gonna allow uh, a centralized government to really play a major impact in their, their lives. Take, for example, the Afghan National Police. They quickly became an extra, now not all Afghan National Police units, but many of them became extractive right off the bat. One of the questions that I heard all the time when I was in Kandahar and the, and the people that I knew in Kandahar would come to me and say, I've got a neighbor that wants to get his bicycle or a motorcycle back uh, from the Afghan National Police who took it. Is there any way you can help in that? And I said, no, there's no way I can help in that. But it, you know, to show you the problems in many areas that I visited, the Afghan National Police was one of the most uh, hated institutions you know, relative to the area. So when you have even the police becoming extractive and a, a general feeling of corruption uh, emanating out of, out of uh, Kabul, I think the people wanted to resor resort back to what they, they always, for two millennia they had. They had strong regional leaders, usually at the district level. And even there, I mean, it's so much different than than so many other countries. I mean, a district leader, at least the way I found them in, in, in many of the uh, districts in, in, in Southern Afghanistan, the districts actually meant something. It was the reach either politically or economically of the leading family in a particular district. I'm not saying that's true all around, but in the majority of districts I was there, I mean, the district boundaries were really much more of the reach of the leading family. And that sort of, it, it, it pushes forward uh, this notion of, of the importance of, of regional leaders, especially when you have a group of people that don't really understand uh, what's going on in Kabul. And um, uh, so, so that's sort of my thoughts on that. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Dr. Ramuz, uh, I mean, the. There was a point made by uh, Professor Johnson about the context, uh, cultural linguistic context, and uh, there often another argument made in favor of uh, a, a strong centralized system in Afghanistan is uh, the ethnic division in the country. 
the central government is seen as a, a as a way to uh, maintain national cohesion, as a way to prevent fragmentation of the uh, of the system, especially in a context where you have many armed groups. What do you think the the impact of uh, what do you think of the merits of those arguments, and what would be the impact of political decentralization on vis-a-vis uh, -vis ethnization uh, or de-ethnization of uh, politics in Afghanistan? What do you think the impact would be on ethnic politics? Thank you. Uh, I think there is a misunderstanding, as there's many other misunderstanding that I already shared with you that. Sometimes, unfortunately, our political elite, they easily misunderstands one thing when another, when another thing. We should not forget that the central power in Afghanistan, it, is, it has been always in the last 20 years, there has always been a president from one ethnic group, and you have always had two vice president from other ethnic minorities. So there have been a good national unity in the palace over the last 20 years to reflect the national unity or to the respect of the political participation of different ethnic group, at least at the level of the palace. But, but there have been all, also some, sometimes some mis misperception or violation of rule of law in terms of implementation, some, some of the things that could have created uh, perceptions in the country as if there, ha there have not been enough social justice in, in the country. Uh, but I should say that it doesn't mean at all that to have a very strong central system in Afghanistan means that to prevent ethnicization of the polity or the economy or the sovereignty of the country. On the contrary, I, I believe that as much as we respect to the political participation of different regions and provinces of Afghanistan, of the rural areas, uh, we kind of strengthen the support of the people behind the political system, especially in a time that we are in a active war with insurgent groups in, in Afghanistan, that they, the insurgents can, of course, invest in any kind of disconnection between central authority and people. We should not forget that we do not have any, any region or province in Afghanistan uh, that is totally or 100 percent occupied by one ethnic group. If you go to the central Afghanistan, you would see a diverse number of ethnic groups. The same in the, in the south or in the east or in the west. The people of Afghanistan have lived together and united for hundreds of years and they have loved each other and they live together. Uh, rather than the ethnicization, which was, I think it was kind of created, it was uh, over lighted over the last uh, 10 years. I think we have another political and cultural identity, which is very live and which is very energetic and dynamic in Afghanistan, which is, I should say regional identities. If you go to the, for example, Greater Kandahar or Greater Pakti or Central Afghanistan, you would see very similar regional cultural proximity that could pro produce very positive energetic dynamism for democracy, for political participation, for keeping the independence and sovereignty of, of this, of this uh, country. This has been always a wrong perception that a very a strong central system in Afghanistan would keep the ethnic groups in, Afga in Afghanistan united. I have my personal perception and I have been studying as well as I have been in negotiation because I went during my mission in India, I was working with more than 50 political parties in Afghanistan and frequently meeting political elite with different ethnic backgrounds never saw any kind of inclination between among any ethnic groups in Afghanistan to think about autonomy or to fight against central uh, government in Afghanistan. On the other side, we should not forget that if we have, for example, a presidential system, it doesn't mean that this is a central system or it's a decentralized system. It can be, there could be different approaches. When we speak about decentralization, it means we speak about democratic 
voices of people from every corner of Afghanistan to participate in a broad-based political system in Afghanistan so that they support the government, the concept of rule of law, the concept of having one nation in Afghanistan to fight the enemies of this country, to support the idea of development goals in Afghanistan, to support human rights, to also come around one national concept. And unfortunately, uh, both international community as well as civil society and political elite in Afghanistan noticed this very late. And when they know this very late, they address it with another mistake that in order to, and instead of bringing political participation of all corners of Afghanistan in the political authority and power of Afghanistan, they went through creation of a unitary state. They thought that if we have somebody from the north and somebody in the south, as two, for example, uh, uh, executive uh, director of the system, I mean, Dr. Abdullah, or we have President Ghani, this would mean a participatory reflection of all the political voices in Afghanistan. This was a mistake. And I think even in the theory that was not suggested in demanding, but in practice, it was another, it was a mistake that gave another wrong signal to the people of Afghanistan that, oh my God, we had only a presidential system. It didn't work. We brought also kind of prime minister. It didn't work. And again, the people were kind of frac fraction again uh, among different pieces. I think the total idea of these kind of addressing diversity of voices or participation of the nation in Afghanistan has been mistaken. In democracies everywhere in the world, we know that the essential thing is the political party. And political party never means to have ethnic representation. Because according to the laws, a political party should respect certain principles and, and fundamentals. So the absence, in the absence of political party, because we created a context, not let political parties to flourish. We fortunately, of course, we should not forget over the last 20 years, we have so many tremendous achievements. One of them was creation of a very dynamic civil society in Afghanistan, establishment of very uh, dynamic institutions such, such as Human Rights Commission, we have separation of power, at least on paper. We have an, uh, apparently a, an independent judiciary system. We have many other institutions. We have a system in place. But the, the, the problem was that the overall steering concept or, or theory of taking a country out of a civil war in a region which is totally hostile against Afghanistan and a, toward uh, uh, an optimal situation of democracy. I think we had this strategic mistake and still I do not see unfortunately in the inside of the political elite in Afghanistan a way and or an approach to address and correct that uh, mistake. Thank you very much. Can I, ra can I raise one question quickly? Um, and correct me if I get any of this wrong, but 60 years ago, when you said Afghan, that was almost synonymous with Pashtun. And that died off as far as I was concerned. But in the last 10 years, that's come back fully. You know, when, when, when they were, Cobb was trying to institute the ID cards, you had all type of ethnic minorities really upset that, Af that Afghan was, was printed on the car because we're not Afghans. You know, I'm Tajik or I'm Hazara or I'm Uzbek. And that's a whole new di dynamic as far as I know that shows how intense the ethnic linguistic fragmentation is. And the other thing that you've got to understand, you know, in every election since 2004, ethnic linguistic groups has, have voted for a block have voted in a block for their candidate from their group. And I mean, you know, when, when there was all kinds of problems with the 2014 election, we, the United States had done the same types of studies that I did and knew that it was a very fraudulent election. And as you know, at that time, there was some rumor 
that that the Panjshiris were going to uh, march into Kabul because they didn't like the results of it. They thought that Abdullah Abdullah, although he's not, you know, he's part Tajik and part uh, Pashtun, but he's a, a clearly associated with the the Tajiks going all, all the way back to Jamiat Islami. But you know, we formed, we pushed that national unity government, which wasn't national and had no unity and really didn't do much governance because we were fearful of the Tajiks and maybe some other minority groups actually rushing into Kabul because of the election results. So, I mean, I don't think, you know, the election showed to me that there hasn't been much of a change. I mean, you still have people voting in blocks rather than come, there has never been Neither Karzai or Ghani, as I mentioned earlier, was never really a national candidate. If you view a national candidate as representing all of the different uh, ethno-linguistic groups in the country. That's a good point. Um, but I mean, if we look at the parliament, uh, Professor Mutsudashvili, I think um, it would be a way to actually maybe adjudicate, debate some of these questions. Because in the parliament, you have um, um, at least relatively more broad-based um, election system. And constitutionally, uh, the parliament holds a lot of power over the executive branch in terms of budget, uh, and, and it also in terms of approving uh, appointments, high uh, important appointments, and the vote of no confidence. So you have a how can you, please. How can you say that when you know? Uh, I think it was twenty-four of the thirty-three legislatures uh, that came out of the Kabul province were elected with less than 1% of the vote. And the leading vote getter had 2% of the vote. Never seen that any place else in the world relative to the legislature. It's, and that, that, what that basically means is one, there's no constituency. He, the, the people had no constituency. I mean, somebody with a large family and popular in a particular neighborhood can be elected. I mean, in the last Walsy Jurg election, there were about 660 vote, 660,000 votes um, that 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 came out of the Kabul process. And some people were elected with just over a thousand votes. I think it had partly to do with the number of candidates. The number of candidates was so high. And I understand that the election system is in a way that you can get elected with a very limited uh, number of votes. But I think the number of candidates was, was a major issue in having people with 1,000 votes uh, go to the parliament. Obviously, it speaks to the issue of political parties that you don't really have a way to kind of structure the elections beyond just You're a single person. Correct. The only so, way the single so, untransferable so let vote... Me, yeah, let me, let me just actually jump in here on this point because I think it's an important issue. The reason you have so many candidates is intentional. That's a consequence of SNTV. So when you have SNTV systems, you create incentives for a number of you know the, the, these huge ballots, right? That's a function of that. That is a consequence of institutional design. So if you didn't have the SNTV system, I mean that this is the counterfactual is that you wouldn't have this. This is common to other SNTV systems. Um, so I think the issue of constituencies is an important one, uh, but I don't think it's the entire question. Um, so you do have, I mean. You, you do have to answer your question about the role of parliament. And I'd be very curious to hear Dr. Ramuz's position on this, you know, someone who works very intimately in parliament. Um, you know, in, in theory, you have a parliament, but actually not a very strong parliament. I think on paper, the parliament's power vis-a-vis -vis the president is actually quite weak. Um, and the parliament does seem to be ignored quite often by the executive, right? So, you know, you sure not, no confidence votes happen, if I, you know, for ministers, but we see these acting, uh, you know, acting appointments all the time to get around and, and other countries do this as well. This is not unique to Afghanistan by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but uh, parliament is also, you know, I was looking last summer, parliament voted down um, uh, President Ghani, he introduced this Dastar Khan program, Mili, uh, Dastar Khan and Mili, right? To, to, uh, to address the COVID crisis. And um, Parliament refused to support this program, right? And even though it was su supported by the donors, Parliament refused to support this program. I think looking at these dynamics is so important because they speak to the frustration, right? That people have with aid programs and the corruption. And I, I know the story is much more complicated, but I believe that program was implemented regardless of what Parliament said, Am I, if I'm not mistaken, Sounds right? So like Parliament... Yes, yeah, so Parliament may say, well, we don't uh, agree with this, but Parliament's... Yeah. 
the one point is just um, so wouldn't that mean that an institutional design argument is uh, not a very strong one because um, the constitutionally guaranteed powers of the parliaments are also ignored? And the second point about the revenue source, because Afghanistan is dependent on foreign aid. Like for example, the decision to fund the Dastar Khan Ali was ultimately made by the World Bank. So the, the, as the US Americans say, the purse power of the parliament is very limited because of the limited domestic revenue basis. Exactly. And that's another point that I think we haven't discussed enough. So um, in post-conflict situations, we've talked a lot about you know, Afghanistan's unique position as a post-conflict environment and the, the challenges of building democracy. And I think Professor Kakar is absolutely right that we have to be very careful in, in how we're judging this and, and understanding the progress of time. Uh, but on the other hand, I think that you have uh, international community that prefers unity of command, that this is a, a state building effort that's really supported by military efforts, and even, you know, well intentioned donors, they want one person to deal with, they want one minister to deal with, if you talk about multiple layers in sort of this uncertain environment, what are they going to prefer. So yeah. I think the international community really doubled down on this unity of command, reinforced it at Bonn and in subsequent um, you know, opportunities. It didn't, in, didn't encourage the kind of pluralism that it talks about, quite frankly. I mean, the national unity government is a, was an extra constitutional um, creation. So I think you have the international community that's really a, a, to fault for this. Um, but you also, it plays into to politicians who, who go to the international community and say, look, you have to give me all the power. You have to concentrate. Um, we can't have political parties because they're just warlords. Um, you have to support me because if you don't, well, it turns into this horrible zero sum game. And I think that the zero sum nature of these kinds of political arrangements really created, I think, a very catastrophic uh, political situation that's worn individual, worn away individual support from the state. And so you create, you know, whoever's in Kabul versus the rest of, versus an opposition, rather than having the opposition and solidifying opposition behind the government. So I don't think everything absolutely right is, it's not institutional design. Um, but I think as Dr. Ramu said, if you go to the provincial level, you know, there are these deep, um, beliefs in regions. And if you look at certain regions, certain regions have gotten things done. Um, certain regions did have charismatic governors who were able to do things, um, but it wasn't because they were following the rule of law. And I don't, it doesn't mean we should believe in benevolent, you know, strong men or something like this. Um, but the fact of the matter is that people could get things done, but it wasn't because they were following the law, it was because they were breaking the laws. Um, and that's really unfortunate that some of the best examples of governance come from these kinds of situations and not do not come from the rule of law. And so at a time where strengthening you know, this very fragile government was so important at the de facto level, the gap between the de jure and the de facto grew and grew and grew over time rather than the opposite. And I think that's as we think about the future, and that's what I really want us to talk about is, I don't think there are any easy answers to this. And I don't think decentralization is a panacea I don't think federalism is a panacea. And I've never spoken about these things in ethnic terms. I've always talked about them in terms of sort of efficiency and accountability. I teach public administration, however naive that may be. Um, but you know, thinking about things in those terms is very important. Um, other people have made you know, ethno-federal um, arguments for this, but I would really double down on what um, Dr. Ramu says is that in communities, people are able to overcome these issues all the time, they're able to deal um, and they coexist um, in pluralist societies in their communities. But that same pluralism, for whatever reason, hasn't translated to politics in Kabul. And politics in Kabul has made this, this situation worse, I would even say over the past 10 years. And you have um, you know, this ethnic rhetoric has become much more uh, polarized over the past 10 years. And it's not coming from communities, it's coming from the center. And I think this really uh, is a cause, I know, for, for concern uh, for many of us as we think about solutions going forward. Thank you. Um, let me go back now to Mr. Cocker as a kind of a concluding remark. And uh, we, Afghanistan yeah. soon may find itself in another like a, a faithful constitutional making process, given the, if the peace process actually makes progress. 
Uh, what do you think are the lessons that we can learn from the 2004 constitution and the 20 years of its life that we should apply in, in this new chapter um, that maybe uh, Afghans may be writing soon? Um, Thank you. Uh, in fact, I'd also prefer that we talk about the future, but I just wanna <clears throat> address a couple of issues. The role of the international community was mentioned. The international community with a lot more force and actually money went into Iraq. The resultant government there was a parliamentary federal republic. I think to assume that international community everywhere goes and likes one person that they want to deal with is again, the facts don't, the experience do not support that. I think the international community in Afghanistan too, it's, I think it's important for our friends everywhere, Afghans and internationals. The current constitution with all its faults and weaknesses it may have are more so the result of the efforts and views of Afghans. That should be really internalized and frankly respected. And then based on that, let's then, and this has never worked. It's a work in progress, just as democracies. So it's important to make suggestions and recommendations and how that can be improved rather than assuming without kind of assuming internationals and others like this and that, and therefore I've once decided this is just not, as I said, it's a little bit disrespectful to Afghans. The Afghans have adopted this constitution more or less. There, is, there are many, there are some who say otherwise, but actually they were not fully involved in the process. So they had the role in it, the driving role in it. I think the notion about also powerful Kabul, it's a, yes, in some areas it's very powerful. In other areas, it's a center of the state, center of and the power of the state. It still cannot collect all its uh, custom revenues. It still cannot actually control illegal seizure of its land in Kabul and actually in provinces and so forth. It cannot make appointments and some of them are mistaken, some of them are wrong, some of them are good. It cannot make, up to a few years ago, it could not remove some of the key officials in the various places. Constitutional experts will tell you the current constitution on paper actually gives the parliament a lot of powers. That is, it can remove ministers by a vote of no confidence. In which other presidential system you have this? The parliament on paper has a lot of powers. The fact that it has not been organized, the fact that yes, political parties are essential and yet they have not worked out well and the parliament is not actually, because the parliament usually works um, in a group. Members work in a group, they cannot work. The fact that all those things have not worked out well, and I hear I also agree with Mr. Johnson and also with New Professor Mastrilli about the, the limited, the small number of constituents that they represent, because the constituencies have not been delineated. They should be actually, well, they've been delineated, but they should be smaller than the provinces. That's why when I was in the, um, in the commission to reform the electoral reform, one thing I recommended was kind of making the constituencies no smaller, because I should know who is my member in the parliament. I do not know right now. I have a lot of friends in the parliament, but I do not know who really represents me. And that's mm -hmm. how I apply to a lot of others. So this notion of uh, that the one thing that a parliament should have, and I think that's where it can have, it should have a way to be able to uh, refer a matter to the constitutional, the Supreme Court for interpretation, which it does not have, that it should have, because that way, if the executive is uh, kind of not doing something that it should be doing according to the constitution, the parliament can actually go and appeal against it. Right now, it doesn't have that power. And therefore, these some of these actions that the executive, because otherwise the parliament doesn't have the army, doesn't have the police. So how it can really enforce itself against the parliament. Thank so you. one That's last point. Answer. Sorry, can I, okay, just, okay, one minute, sorry. Absolutely. I think we have to take steps to recognize and fully appreciate and value the pluralism that we have in this country. And I think, you know, again, uh, for the, in allowing people at the regional, at the local level to make decisions as much as possible, that is extremely, I mean, that 
that is attractive and that should be done. But in that thing, decentralization, as I'm sure uh, Christian Professor Matsuri knows very well, in various forms of it, it's fiscal, administrative, political. So there are things that actually can be taken, even in the political, you know, if we have the parliament from different smaller constituents, that is a decentralization, political decentralization. Because the parliament right now is not decentralized. It is actually. So in our thing on the fiscal, and in particular on the administrative level, we can make a lot of headway in improving and empowering the people in the beyond Kabul to make and, decisions and to make their life easier and to services that could be provided to them uh, no better. <laughs> Sorry, Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Johnson, same question. What do you think Afghanistan should be doing moving forward? Uh, um, in the new chapter that is coming up, what lessons have we learned? How should we apply them? Well, I think that I think that you really need to change your electoral system. Um, and relative to the legislature, there's no reason to have it elected at the part at the, the provincial level. You know, you have, I mean, one of the one of the very interesting things about Afghanistan, and I know the dis number of districts ha has grown over the last few years, but why not use those districts to represent uh, a legislator? Then the people of that district will have an ex the legislator will have an explicit contention uh, 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 um, group that's that he represents, and people will know who represents them. So, and first of all, the NS you know single non-transferable voting without a parliament without a a, a strong uh, uh, party system is just is just not going to work. And I think also that over the short term, you need to bring in more international observers and have them located at the right place for even presidential elections. Um, I think elections are important. Again, I, I agree with Jen that, you know, the government, what's really important with democracy is the governance that goes between the different elections. But, you know, the president has so much power in, in, in your country right now. And that's not necessarily bad, but um, uh, with the rising, which I envision, the rising ethno-linguistic fragmentations, that can be very, very uh, disconcerting because you do, and nobody can deny it, that you have blacks voting for their, their ethnicity in all of these elections. And th that's just not the way that we want to have democracy develop in, in Afghanistan. So I think there needs to be a lot of structural changes. I think the separation between the different branches have to be much more clear. I, I think that you know the Constitution, uh, parts of the Constitution have been ignored from day one. And I think that you know uh, that has to change. But the last thing that I want to say, and this will be controversial for a lot of people, but the United States didn't want anybody to challenge Karzai. Karzai was our man. You know, so many things that came out of Bond and later um, represented um, institutions that were not meant to be powerful because they could challenge Karzai. And up until 2006, 2007, we had great faith in Karzai. And um, and he was our guy. Nobody was going to be president. You know, don't forget in the the in the Loya Jurga that it, that was held in June um, uh, 2002. You know, many delegates many delegates uh, put down a petition to bring back the king in you know ceremonial positions, and Kalalazad and uh, millions of dollars from a certain. Uh, uh, institution in the United States, and I'm not going to mention, made that go away. Um, you know, so I personally believe, uh, you know, I mean, Zahir Shah was never really an administrator. I mean, he was a great fly fisherman, but for most of his career, his three his three uncles ran the show. But I, I think that's, if, if I was going to name, you know, a second thing uh, that really has upset and turned over the the apple cart in Afghanistan, not only parts of Bond, but this, this notion that, um, uh, that we 
the United States set up a lot of the institutions in Afghanistan, quite frankly, with the knowledge that they did not want to have anybody to be able to challenge Karzai. Thank you. Thank you for that point. Um, Dr. Ramuz, um, the same question from you, uh, for you. What do you think we should learn moving forward? I think the very essential question here is that why the decline of political institution in Afghanistan started from 2010 onward. We had very great achievements from 2001, 2010. Uh, things were going in a relatively positive uh, way over the first decade of the Afghanistan transformation. But in the second decade, things unfortunately changed uh, toward being de deteriorated. I think we should find the answer to this essential question that why political institution in Afghanistan decayed in a very short time. This is number one. Second, we should always, we should not forget this, that if we do not have good political institution, if we do not support the idea of political parties in Afghanistan, the ethnic cards will be played by the political elite. The third thing is that there can be also very good grounds for supporting democracy in the constitution of Afghanistan. But unfortunately, we have relatively corrupt political elite that they have united together to misuse their power and all of these opportunities and to decay every single opportunity and, and, and misuse them. This is the right moment for Afghanistan elites, people of Afghanistan and international community to draw, redraw again their vision for future. I think it is too, it's too early not to let United Nations play a role. I think this is also very essential for any election in the future. There should be a significant role for United Nations to play a yeah. professional yeah. neutral role. Thank you, thank you, I appreciate yeah. it. Professor Mustazar, uh, Mustazar Shfili, um, same question to you and you're gonna be the last speaker, please. Great, thank you. And I just want to be very clear here that um, you know nobody is uh, disrespecting the agency of the people of Afghanistan for for their many achievements uh, over the past twenty years. But I do think we have to remember some of the dynamics that Professor Professor Johnson has brought up in terms of the role that the United States played um, illicitly and illicitly in ways that we don't even know or fully understand, and especially in in, in enabling the corrupt environment, right? The, and, um, I mean, I was quite opposed to much of what we saw with this civilian surge that occurred, you know, 10 years ago at the point where Dr. Ramuz points to sort of this breakdown of democratic institutions because the amount of money that was poured into the country um, to sort of counteract a military surge um, from the U.S. side, I think, fed so much of the corruption. If you can't monitor money that you're bringing in and you're just giving out money, you're you, you're undermining the very system of accountability that you're, support, you're supposed to build. And I think this is where I think the United States especially bears a lot of responsibility for many of the outcomes that we see. So I wanna be absolutely clear about that. In terms of the future, um, giving people outside of Kabul more of a say, I think that one lesson that we've learned from this is that this story about state consolidation bringing everything to bear in the center. Um, and we can look back and say, you know, history tells us something. It's 20, hindsight is 2020. 20. Um, the problems that the current system is trying to address are no longer the same problems. And we know that, that for whatever reason, um, that this effort to consolidate the center to, to solve ethnic problems, to solve the warlord problems actually made them worse. And so the counterfactual is, is it time to try something else? This is really for the people of Afghanistan to, dis to decide, to discuss. It's really um, up, up to the, of the people of Afghanistan. But I think we have to look at this counterfactual very carefully. When, when we're told that if you decentralize authority, the country will, will break into pieces. If you uh, give people more say, if you create more political parties, you'll just have warlords. What's the counterfactual? Is doubling down on the current system solving that or making it worse? And that's, that's a question that I think that um, the bright minds here will have to address in, in, the, in the months and years to come. Great point.
Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Professor Zajfali, uh, for your great point and also for this great uh, article, Democracy Denied the False Promise of a Partisan Constitutional Order. And thank you for uh, all our esteemed panelists for their um, insights and um, their um, diverse view, but I think they all share a goal of making Afghanistan better moving forward and we can learn from all these lessons. I mean, that the, usually the truth is comes out when you have diverse views clashing and that's what we had here. I think, um, thank you all uh, very much and thank you Afghanistan Institute for Strategic Studies for organizing this. I did not introduce myself in the beginning, but I will do at the end. I'm Harun Rahimi. I teach at American University of Afghanistan and and I'm a fellow here at Oxford Center for Islamic Studies. Thank you so much for tuning in and thank you for our great panelists for your uh, contribution.